welcome to smart catalyst december 10 2018 so today we are going to see three prelims articles one is center amends the rules for minorities from three nations the second prelims article is why reforms at wto could go against the interest of india the third one is bioplastic seen as a viable alternative so the first article is center amends the rules for minorities from three nations so what the news here is the citizenship amendment bill 2016 is still pending in the parliament but the union home ministry has notified certain amendments to the citizenship rules of 2009 so what kind of amendments means it include a separate column in the citizenship form to include six minority communities, especially from three nations. What are those three nations means? Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. So who are those six minority communities means? Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhist, Parsis, Jains and Christians. Okay. So these six minorities from these three nations are now coming under the ambit of this provision that is this citizenship rules 2009 provision. Okay. So who empowers them or who under which act they bring this amendment means the section 18 of the citizenship act of 1955. So under this only under this section 18 it actually empowers the home ministry to give an executive action for enabling such kind of amendment in the citizenship rules. Okay. So if you see the background that citizenship bill 2016 actually proposes citizenship to six persecuted minorities as we have seen before who came to India before 2014. So this kind of proposal of giving citizenship to these minorities is actually inviting a strong resistance in the Assam region especially because as per the Assam Accord of 1985 whoever migrating from Bangladesh into Assam after 1971 March they should be deported back to Bangladesh so that is what the provision in this Assam Accord of 1985 right but this new citizenship amendment bill of 2016 is reversed that that means it is like paving the way for giving citizenship mostly to illegal Hindu migrants from Bangladesh to Assam before 2014 so it is against that Assam Accords provision so only there is a strong resistance in Assam region okay so this kind of proposal of including the persecuted minorities into the northeastern states especially in the Assam region not only invites the religious tension but also it increases the demographics as a whole in the northeast state right so that is why there is a strong tension as well as the resistance going on in the Assam region so while the citizenship amendment bill 2016 is pending in parliament this new proposal of amending the citizenship rule of 2009 is also increasing the tension but they are stating like this amended rules are not in violation to the work of the parliamentary committee and it is done only to provide the relief to the people and the decision to grant the citizenship to these persecuted minorities will be cleared by the parliament soon. So this is what they stated. So the next article is why reforms at WTO could go against the interest of India. So we all knew that WTO is a multilateral trade organization. It always ensures the free global trade. Okay free and fair global trade all across the world but recently the WTO which is a multilateral organization is falling short of its objective and so there is a room for improvement so because of that recently the developed countries so in order to meet that in the recent G20 meet all the developed countries proposed to reform the WTO but India is actually concerned about the new proposal because what that proposal in the sense so instead of being a consensus driven mechanism or consensus driven body it should be changed to a majority driven body or voting based body okay so this or uh, this is the proposal which is put forward in the G20 recently so what this means the consensus driven means if all the 164 countries in the WTO accept for a proposal then only it will come into effect so that is what generally the consensus driven mean but what the majority driven means if a majority of the developed countries or if a majority number of countries are accepted to the newer proposal then it will automatically come into effect so it for example uh, for this majority driven means it is TFA which is the trade facilitator agreement which is coming under the ambit of WTO okay so it is an example for majority driven for example this kind of vote based is followed in IMF which means 
the voting is done on the basis of assigned weights done to the each and every country in the IMF. If a country has more share of money or investment in IMF, then then that country has more voting share. Okay. So how much money you invest depend on that your voting share is decided. Okay. So this is what this voting based mechanism means. So instead of consensus driven, the WTO should be transferred or transformed into a majority driven or voting based driven uh, body. That is what the new proposal which is put forward in this uh, recent G20 meeting. But it might be against India's interest. Why? Because this majority or vote based is giving importance only to the developed nations so it is having say only for developed nation and not for developing nation so as we india is a developing nation we are not having that much say if in case this new uh, transformation is happening okay and one more thing you have to note here is this tfa which is the trade facilitation benefit it's, it is available only to the wto member for example, under this TFA agreement, if two third of the members are okay with any kind of proposal or agreement, then it will automatically come into effect and that agreement and benefits are available only to the members who signed the deal. Okay, So it left out the all other members. So it is a major drawback, right? So it should not be again uh, coming into WTO transformation. So this is what India is again proposing. Okay. So why India is not accepting this new WTO transformation or reforms in the sense because if you see India is often accused of stalling negotiations by taking the advantage of this consensus driven approach. For example, at WTO's 11th ministerial conference in Buenos Aires, India actually blocked the agreement that would include a ministerial decision on fishery subsidy, e-commerce and moratorium on customs duty. So we actually stalled these kind of negotiations. Why? Because why we stalled means we cited SND mechanism as a blockage. That means SND means special and differential treatment. Okay. This special and differential treatment is only for developing countries, which is a conclusion of the Doha development agenda. But India cited like though SND is available for developing countries, these uh, negotiations are actually out of the ambit of SND mechanism. So it is only beneficial to the developed nations and not for the developing nations. So that is why we actually stalled the negotiation. So this is what India cited. Okay. So you have to know about this special and differential mechanism of Doha development agenda. And also the official stated like it will not be India's interest though China is currently opposed to this WTO reforms it may force it to accept in the future that would means India and Ch South Africa are the only countries which are left alone opposing to this WTO reform. We should come forward so that we can avoid this kind of contentious issues like protectionism, unilateral measures as well as the unfair trade due to the differences between US and China. So we should recognize the contribution that the multilateral trading system like this WTO has made and consensus among the small and the large developing countries is needed to counter the attempts to tamper this multilateral outlook of the World Trade Organization. So the next article is bioplastic seen as a viable alternative. So this article talks about the bioplastics and its positives as well as the negatives. So the bioplastics are biodegradable and compostable plastic material, which means they can be easily made from a wide range of materials such as sugarcane, corn and other plant based resources. And they can be easily turned into compost after the usage with little damage to the environment when compared to the normal single use plastics. Okay, So among the bioplastics, the polylactic acid, which is known as PLA, it is a very viable option to uh, as an alternative to the single use plastics. And this polylactic acid plastics are generally made from plant resources. So they are degradable both under aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions with the or without the presence of oxygen they can easily be degraded okay this is the main advantage of this polylactic plastics and they also do not pollute the environment and they can be used as a variety of things such as spoons plastic containers and tumblers etc so if you see in this picture what are the items from which the bioplastics can be made means the agro based feedstocks such as the sugar cane which are rich in carbohydrate and corn so these items can be used to make the bioplastics 
and lignocellulosic feedstock means whatever the plants which are not eligible for food as well as the feed production which is not a food and a fodder so these kind of uh, feedstock can also be used to make this bioplastics and finally the organic wastes feedstock can also be made used to make, make the bioplastics so far we have seen like what are the positives of the bioplastic and how it contribute to the environment and how it reduces the greenhouse gas everything right but there are certain concerns also for the usage of this bioplastic because it may lead to the increase in the GHG greenhouse gas emissions why because obviously in order to accommodate this production of the bioplastic we need a huge amount of or vast tract of land right so for that obviously we are going to expand the cropland so this cropland expansion will further increase the greenhouse gas emission for example if you are going to convert any forest area or a grassland area or any usable area into an arable land for this production of sugar cane or corn then these forest areas or the grassland areas which still now consuming or helping in reduction of CO2 is now missing right and instead of this now the cropland is coming so obviously the CO2 consumption by the plants are now getting reduced so which in turn further increase the greenhouse gas emission so it is an indirect impact of how the cropland expansion actually lead to the increase in greenhouse gas and also the plastics are usually made from petroleum with the associated impacts in terms of fossil fuel depletion so if plastics are made from petroleum then we are going to explore more fossil fuels so it is going to deplete the existing fossil fuels right and also the climate change they concluded by saying like in reality it will take a very lot of time for switching over from the normal single use plastic into bioplastics to pay off or to get the expected result so now we are going to see all these main articles. The first one is death in the air on air pollution. The second one is human cost of pollution must drive us to act. The third one is tyranny of the majority. The fourth one is structural reforms for decarbonizing India. And the last article is China and India struggling to rebalance. So the first article is death in the air on tackling air pollution. So we all knew that pollution is the biggest environmental cause of premature death which is according to a Lanson study. So this pollution induced diseases are very prevalent among the middle income as well as the low income countries. So if you see an estimated 1.24 million people in India in 2017 or die because of this air pollution. So if you see this kind of intensity, then the air pollution should be among the highest policy priorities. So this is what they put forward in this article. So if you see in this picture, Nearly 16% of all the deaths which is happening worldwide, it is majorly due to the air pollution and in that nearly 25% of the deaths in India is mainly due to the air pollution. So, and also the minorities and the marginalized as well as the children, they are at higher risk to these kind of pollution related diseases. So, on considering all these, we should make the air pollution and its policies as the highest priority. Okay, so that is what they put forward here. And if you see the Global Burden of Disease 2017 report, it is given by Lancent. Okay. So in that they stated like the impact of air pollution on deaths, disease burden and life expectancy across the states. These are mainly due to the deadly results of official apathy. That means the policy makers or the lawmakers are not even considering the impacts of the air pollution and because of the official apathy only there is a huge impact on the deaths as well as the disease burden as well as the life of the people of india as a whole okay and millions of people are forced to lead morbid lives or they face premature death due to the bad air quality which they are breathing and if you see the WTO actually estimated like only 10 micrograms per cubic meter it should be the standard for the ambient particulate matter 2.5 but if you see in our country it is 40 40 micrograms per cubic meter so it is very high than the WTO standard so it is a major concern and 77 percent of the population are exposed to these higher levels of uh, pollution the same Lanson report also stating like if the country if our country if it gives greater attention to the air pollution and its impact and if it try to reduce the air pollution then people who are living in the worst affected states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan and Jharkhand they could live more than 1.7 years to their normal life expectancy. So see how much the air pollution actually causes or reduces the age of the 
uh, life expectancy of the people is itself right so, so what could be the solution for these air pollution in the sense they are actually underscoring certain clean alternatives as an option so the sustainable solution should be there instead of stubble burning or use of the solid fuels in household we should switch over to these sustainable solution this is what they first put forward okay and it this sustainable solution like this should only be done by the state governments right so the state government should come forward and try to make the people adopt to these kind of solutions and the center should also work with punjab and the haryana which is the major stubble burner region so thereby they can uh, actually distribute the machineries to the farmers and the cooperative societies so that they can switch over to other uh, sustainable alternatives so apart from the sustainable solutions we can also make use of the technology thereby we can collect more farm residues and we can convert them into biomass and we can recover the value of the biomass and we can easily convert the straw into useful products and solid fuels into lpg thereby the millions of low income homes has provided the health benefits indirectly so potential of this domestic biogas units solar cookers and improved biomass cookstoves so these are can also be options to be explored because if you go for this kind of options then there is no additional expenditure for the rural people as well as the less affluent households so we can go for all these options so this is also put forward in the same report so also they are stating like even the quality of the fuel which is provided to the consumers they are now getting increased uh, though the quality fuel is available the traffic densities in the cities are increasing rapidly which actually negated the positive impacts of the quality fuel so we have to take this into consideration and there is no real time measurement of the pollution and there is no ground level monitoring stations so this all should be implemented thereby we can track the air pollution and its impact and we can reduce it to a to its entirety okay so the next article is human cost of pollution must drive us to act so this article was taken from the live mint so if you see in this article it is also stating the impacts of the air pollution it state like one out of eight deaths in india is only by means of air pollution and it also indicates the worsening situation in india as india's annual average ambient of pm 2.5 exposure is very very high and if you see nearly 1.24 million deaths and 0.67 million deaths and 0.48 million deaths are due to the air pollution ambient particulate matter pollution and household air pollution respectively so these are all stated in the same lancet report okay so if you see in this picture it is indicating the deaths due to the toxic air so the west bengal is the highest or biggest to victim of the air pollution and it has like 6000 deaths due to the air pollution and followed by andhra uttar pradesh madhya pradesh karnataka and delhi okay so total deaths account for nearly 35000 in the period of 2006 to 2015 it is mainly because of air pollution so deaths not directly attributed to air pollution but to acute respiratory infections so these are the top 6 states and 11% of the premature deaths were due to air pollution and this air pollution is mainly contributed by the transportation sector the transportation sector that is the usage of the two wheelers and the four wheelers in our country is increasing each and every city is uh, actually experiencing a vast increase of the in two wheelers and four wheelers and thereby it actually increases the pollution to a very high level so if you see the suffer data which is the system of air quality and weather forecasting which is under the ministry of earth sciences so they actually checks the air quality and they stated like the transport sector emission alone is increased by 40% in the last 8 years so the transport sector is the major contributor for the air pollution and the epca which is the environment pollution control authority they are also called for some strengthening of the integrated public transport system thereby we can reduce the air pollution so a seamless integrated and efficient transport system is a viable option so it should be there thereby we can encourage the using of public transport okay in order to encourage the public transport a seamless integrated and efficient transport system must be encouraged thereby people switch over from their individual use of vehicles to a public transport right and apart from that the citizen should also be encouraged to upgrade their vehicles to switch over to more fuel efficient standard uh, vehicles or engines and all okay and not only that people should also be encouraged to adopt a sustainable lifestyle 
that relies on lesser energy consumption technologies and equipments like sustainable lifestyle, sustainable building design should also be there to reduce the electricity consumption because two third of the India's electricity is fossil fuel based so we have to switch over to sustainable buildings and while planning itself the city based decentralized planning should be made so the urban migration is also on rise that means it is increasing people are frequently migrating to the urban cities so the smart cities mission which is focusing on building smarter cities should focus on building sustainable cities so this is put forward in that same report so if you see in this picture actually India ratifies the Paris climate deal in 2015 which actually aims to limit the global warming to 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels so these in the right side if you see these are India's plan that means NDC intended nationally determined contribution right so as per the INDC actually India promised to reduce the emission intensity by at least 33% by 2030 and to generate 40% of electricity from non-fossil fuel by 2030 and to create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons. So these are all put forward by India in INDC during the Paris climate deal. Okay. So these are all to actually intensify the actions and funds for a sustainable low carbon future. So the next article is tyranny of the majority. So this article talks about that in the name of democracy, how the majority ruling is happening in India. Okay. So if you see here, it started like democracy is not the best form of government unless it ensures that the majority is unable to reduce everyone to political insignificance but itself, which means if the majority is over dominant thereby it can reduce every other people to political insignificant but maintaining their status as high so this is put forward by john stuart mill in his book considerations on representative government so the majority group has some unspecified right implicitly to imprint its will on the body politics that means majority is always having an influence in the political decisions and it is un though it is unspecified it is always trying to imprint its will in the political decisions so that is what he stated in that book okay so why we actually saw his quote in the sense because this is what now happening in our country so this is what put forward by the author in this article if you see the in democracy the very idea of the majority rule is actually trumped by grant of fundamental rights so that means always the fundamental rights are uh, greater than the majority rule and it is if you see in the fundamental right the right not to be discriminated against anyone on the basis of religion caste class gender or sexual preferences so this clearly indicates that each citizen is an equal shareholder in the political system and no one is far ahead of any other people and what group we belong to, what faith we profess, what language we speak, it is irrelevant and everyone is equal in front of the constitution. So this is what actually uh, envisioned by the makers of our constitution and the makers of constitution always committed to this understanding of democracy. Under democracy everyone is equal, that is what they stated. Okay, But if you see in 1949, H.V. Cometh actually moved or asked for an amendment in the preamble of our constitution like it should begin with the phrase of in the name of God. So this clearly shows the sectarian tendency or narrow sectarian spirit which is prevailing at that time especially among some people right and it is actually contrary to the spirit of the constitution as a whole but this proposal was actually disagreed by a lot of other people in the constitution assembly and they were stated like we shouldn't impose our feelings on others so it is actually uh, defeated this amendment was defeated okay so it shows clearly that how our constitution makers are always want the power holders to respect the principle of religious neutrality so all the power holders who were in the highest position they should respect the principle of religious neutrality they shouldn't uh, lean towards any particular religion so this is what the focus of or the intent and the framework of our constitution as a whole but matters are dramatically different today because in present politics though the prominent leaders assured the minorities but in reality the party in power continue to assert that the religious majority had a natural right to rule in India so this is put forward by the author in this article so he is like blaming the party in power and one example case 
for example, in SR Bombay versus Union of India case 1994, they clearly stated the Supreme Court upheld her equality is the essential basis of the constitution irrespective of the religious affiliation of citizens an indian state is not expected to give privilege to one people or give privilege to one religion over another religion because our country is neither religious nor irreligious it is secular so each and every power holder should actually abide by this principle right but now the foundation of the democratic system is trembling because of the rising tide of the bigotry and the hate if you see recently the re rulings of the supreme court is very different like it is openly floated by the political ideologies so each and every ruling of the supreme court is actually influenced highly by the political ideologies of the present political party or the opposition political party whatever and not only the supreme court's ruling but also the party in the power as well as the opposition party for its own political ideology as well as the religious ideology if you see the party in power is actually visited ill being of the people by means of it actually have done a lot of things like demonetization gst and apart from that it actually harassment of the universities sabotage of the institutions violation of the fundamental rights sanctions of the public lynchings and now a murder of the policeman all these things actually created a very bad name for the party in power among the people but apart from that it somewhat maintained to live up to its ignoble reputation as a party of the majority because of its uh, religious dominance in the name of hindutva so this is what they stated at least the party in power is holding a stand but the opposition party has no distinct ideology itself and they has opted to become an anemic version of the party in power so this is what actually a major concern which is put forward by the author okay so after all we are at the end of the assembly election in five states and general elections are also around the corner so the topmost priority has to be given for all these things instead of the religious practices because india stands at crucial juncture before the general election so we have to take the farmers condition insecure workers women condition as well as the minorities who are increasingly rendered irrelevant they are uh, the lower cost people so these are the actual problems so pe um, each and every party political party should focus on this instead of going towards any religious practices or religious majority support and all so the author concluded here by saying that elections give citizens an opportunity to discuss the policies and the proposed political agendas and exercise their free choice while voting but the forthcoming election breeds pessimism because there is no lack of choices and the present political parties are not uh, so different from each other so thereby they offer no choice to the people so the next article is the structural reforms for decarbonizing india so this article talks about what kind of structural reforms need to be done for decarbonizing india so if you see india actually surpassed france to become the sixth largest economy of the world and it poised to become third largest economy in 2028 that means we are growing very rapidly in terms of economy so the rapid economic growth is often driven by increase in energy demand and consequently higher carbon dioxide emissions as we are growing rapidly our country is actually experiencing a huge energy demands thereby obviously the consumption of these energy consequently lead to higher carbon dioxide emissions right so we have to do some kind of steps thereby we can reduce the carbon dioxide thereby we can decarbonize india so if you see as we have already seen the paris agreement deals so india has committed to reduce it by 33 to 35 percentage by 2030 and 40 percent of its electricity generation is majorly from non fossil uh, sources by 2030 so these are all our indc targets right so to achieve all these what is the need of the or in the sense we need the structural reforms thereby we can facilitate the decarbonization of environment as a whole so what kind of structural reforms can be done in the sense india's electricity pricing policy need to be significantly overhauled so we have to first change the pricing policy itself because the financial health of the distribution companies is an important cog in the political economy of india's energy sector so current policy actually subsidizes electricity prices for agriculture and residential consumers okay so for these two people only our government is providing or our current policy is providing subsidies 
and it penalizing actually the commercial and the industrial consumers because they are the major consumers that means nearly 80 percent of india's energy use is based on the fossil fuels and in that 80 percent nearly commercial and industry are the major users of the fossil fuels and not the agri or residential uh, consumers so only they are penalizing them and they are giving subsidies to them but there should be some kind of structural change thereby we can reduce further the usage of this fossil fuel this is what proposed first and the second one is the revamping of market design of india's electricity sector is a must Currently, most coal power plants operate to serve the base load demand, but we should switch over from the coal based power plant to the renewable energy, thereby we can reduce the CO2 emissions, right? And also, not only this kind of change, but the banking sector reforms are also have to be done, thereby we can create a less capital, high interest rate, risk averse banking sector to give more money to these kind of renewable energy projects or biofuel projects and all. So these kind of banks are only ready to give the money to these kind of projects, right? So we have to encourage these kind of risk averse banking sector for meeting the unconventional energy businesses. And last major reform could be India's bond market because we are not that much good in uh, larger bond market. We are not having that much greater bond market. But we have to promote especially the green bond, thereby we can provide critical financial support for environment friendly investment, thereby we can reduce the CO2 emission to a greater extent. So what they are concluding here is India needs to meet its decarbonizing goal not only for meeting its climate commitments and economic targets but also for fulfilling its human development objectives. So the last article is China and India struggling to rebalance. So this article compares the Indian economy with the Chinese economy. So if you see here, if you see China, it is mostly demand constrained and it's trying to cousin its structural deceleration, which means in China, the demand is less, but the production or supply is more, thereby it is actually used to export every items to other countries. So it is an export driven economy that is what they actually mentioned here, export driven model of development. But India, in India it is very contrast like we are having more demand, demand is high but the supply is very less. So we usually use it to import more into our economy. So they are stating like we should have become more export oriented economy in the future thereby we can get more integration in trade as well as the capital flows with the rest of the world and India is yet to unlock its potential for higher trend growth that means we are having lot of reserves and lot of resources but it is yet to unlock. So we have to make use of that that is what they stated. So we are actually supply constrained economy. China is a demand constrained economy okay and if you see in terms of per capita GDP China actually has surged five times in per capita GDP in the period of 2006 to 2018 but in the same period India's per capita GDP increased only two and a half times and they are also actually comparing the entry of both China as well as India into the World Trade Organization. By means of entering into World Trade Organization, China has benefited a lot by means of lot of agreements like the trade, free trade agreement and trade facilitation agreement etc. Right. So by means of all these, China has benefited a lot but, but the similar sized country which is India which is entering into WTO at the same time like China but we are not having that much, we are not benefiting that much as equivalent to China. So what India needs is a similar sized tectonic disruption as China has experienced so that we can ensure an outsized multiplier impact on both the growth as well as the economic evolution as a whole. And also they are comparing China's early focus on education, skills and infrastructure. So China started to focus on these uh, sectors very early and that is why they can able to provide good quality as well as reasonably priced products. But India is still struggling to reform the agriculture and education itself and there is no scope or there is no space available for India to focus on the skill developing and all. That is why India's manufacturing se sector is still remains lopsided though it has improved in the recent decade 
it has actually more scope to develop but it still remains lopsided and also they are comparing here the china's infrastructure project with india's infrastructure project if you see here china's focus on high quality infrastructure was well noticeable before the problem of china's structural deceleration occurs but india is still not a major infrastructure driven country so india wants more investment driven growth especially focused on its creaky infrastructure but it is still struggling to jump start the upturn in investment so we have to focus more on the investment driven growth this is what they stated so they concluded here by saying that the pace of rebalancing of both the countries that is india as well as china will continue to be slower than what the investors actually expect because the financial markets actually suffer from tunnel vis vision and they look for quicker outcomes but in reality the adjustment or the rebalancing of the financial situation or economy in any country will take time so they concluded here by saying that instead of allowing the local politics and the external factors to dictate how the policy should be rather than the faster and the more far reaching reforms or the need of the or in order to decide how the economic policy of any country including both india as well as china should be thank you